when you're ready. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to UCLA Virtually. I'm uh, Cherie Francis from UCLA's Graduate Division in the Fellowships and Financial Services Unit. And it's my pleasure to speak with you all this afternoon about the funding for grad school. There is money out there for each and every one of you. I know that most of you are, so, you know, the McNair program expects that you'll be applying for uh, doctoral programs, but should you decide to start with a master's program first, the information that I'm going to give to you um, is going to be uh, applicable to any time you're looking for funding, even post uh, graduate school when you're looking for funding for your career, whether it be as a professor, as a director of a think tank, running your own um, community theater or public health unit, the process of looking for money is the same. It's just that the objective of why you're looking for money is the difference. And that's what you need to pay attention to is to look for funding that is specific for why you're going, uh, why you're looking for it. Um, so here's my contact info. I believe you will have access if you don't already to the slides. Feel free to contact me by email, by phone. I, even though I'm working from home, I do pick up my um, office email uh, voicemails. And even if you're not planning to attend to UCLA or any of the UCs, my interest here is to help you uh, find funding. And hopefully um, you'll like I say, there's money out there for each and every one of you. You're McNair scholars, so you're definitely uh, among the ones that are going to be very competitive for the program, for the funding. Okay, so, and also feel free to ask questions during the presentation. Uh, Sandra's going to help me uh, figure out who's in the chat, because right now I can only see, I think, myself and four others, so I can't see if you raise your hand. So if you put anything in the chat, Sandra is going to ask. I will also leave time at the end for um, questions. So if nothing else today, because I know this is lunchtime, you've been at the conference already in several days, I believe. Um, so you're going to retain and learn different things depending on where you are in the process, where you are mentally in terms of attention span. Um, so if nothing else, uh, you should take away these five things. And also, I want you to attend as many of these sessions as possible because, again, as I said, what you retain and learn differs depending on where you are in the process and where you are just in terms of your uh, attention span. So if nothing else, you need to equate applying for admission with applying for funding. So you apply for funding at the same time as you apply for admission. So if you're thinking of going to grad school in fall of 22, you would be applying now and this fall. Do not wait until you've been accepted because the agencies are funding you as a potential researcher or scholar. You may not know where you're going to wind up, but you do know or you will know where you are applying and that's what you need to indicate to um, the funding, the fellowship or scholarship committees is that I'm looking to go to uh, the civil and engineering department at UCLA because I want to work with Professor Jennifer J. I'm thinking of going to, uh, I'm applying to the English department at UCLA because I want to work with Professor Yarbrough. So as you've probably already learned, the grad process is much more decentralized than the undergrad. You're applying to a particular program or department. You're not applying to the university. And then you need to make that known to your uh, fellowship scholarship committee. Apply for extramural, which means um, funding from federal agencies, private agencies, not affiliated with the university. Um, even if you think your program will fully fund you sometimes, they will, but often it's in the form of uh, maybe a fellowship or scholarship the first year, but it's going to be um, some kind of work in subsequent years. And the work like a TA ship or a research assistant ship is great experience, but it's taking time away from you, uh, from your studies. And what's going to be expected of you as a doctoral student or even as a master's student is vastly different than what's expected of you as an undergrad. And also, if you're coming from an institution that has is on the semester system and you're coming to a place like UCLA, which is on the quarter system, that's going to smack you in terms of what is going to be um, expected of you know, what you're going to experience. Also, if you're coming from a historically black college or university or Hispanic serving institution, 
to a place like UCLA, which is a predominantly white institution, that's going to be a social cultural shock. If you're coming to a large city like LA or New York from a smaller town, that's going to be a shock. So you want to give yourself as many buffers uh, to succeed in grad school as you can. And part of that is having your own money. And I'll go into a little bit more detail of why having the outside money, the extramural money uh, has at least three benefits. Uh, four, there is no one list of fellowships. What you're eligible for depends on you, your sex, your um, ethnicity sometimes, your race. Uh, your uh, nationality also depending on your heritage, your degree objective definitely matters, your field of study, et cetera. So this presentation offers you tips and resources to help you find funding. And uh, again, what, if, whether you're going for the master's or the doctorate or the professional master's like the MBA or the MSW, MPP or the professional doctor, the EDD, uh, the uh, DRPH, the PsyD, PSYD for the psychology, the information is the same. It's just you'll need to tweak things um, depending on what, what uh, degree objective and what field you're going for and then who you are. And then finally, my mantra, apply for anything and everything for which you are eligible for as long as you are eligible. If you don't get the fellowship the first time around, you're denied or you put on wait list, honorable mention, alternate, whatever the agency calls, they're not awarded and you're eligible to apply in the next cycle, please do so. These agencies are in the business of wanting to fund you, so you need to give them as strong and as competitive an application as possible. Some agencies will give you feedback uh, uh, automatically, and so definitely take that feedback into account when you are submitting a revision. Some agencies will only give you feedback upon request, so make that request. Some agencies won't be able to give you feedback, but uh, that's okay because they don't have enough personnel, but you're going to be getting enough feedback from the process that you have uh, undertaken to apply by asking your faculty mentor, your peers, senior graduate students, um, uh, postdocs, siblings and friends, even if they're not in the same field as you, the same educational level as you, the whole thing about right, uh, good academic writing, the good writing in any case, is that you're uh, purpose is clear and it's communicated clearly. So again, apply for anything and everything for which you are eligible for as long as you're eligible. Um, so part of knowing about funding, these are the resources, is knowing the vocabulary. So uh, the funding for grad school, I think, uh, yeah, I skipped this one. Uh, funding for grad school is called, what I call is financial support. So if you were to come to my office, um, and ask about financial aid, which is the second bullet here. Hopefully our student workers are savvy enough to ask, are you sure you're talking about financial aid alone, which means loans uh, or, or financial support, which includes loans and fellowships, scholarships and grants. Uh, the terminology again, depends on the agency, excuse me, but they're all different ways to fund your graduate study, your graduate research. Um, grants uh, at the graduate level um, usually are the only what you might, I'm sorry, let me back up. Grants usually are attached to a research grant that a faculty member would have, and then they would hire you on their research grant. But there's also funding for you uh, as a flat out, um, like a fellowship or scholarship, and that you get the money, you don't have to go through a faculty member. Uh, and this is the, in the Fulbright Hayes, the Fulbright US student, those are at least two agencies that call their funding grants. So the takeaway from this is that don't not look at something because you think it doesn't apply to you. Look to see what type of funding it is, who it's for, and if it's for graduate study, graduate research, then definitely pursue it further. Um, these types of funding come from a variety of sources. Of course, the department or program to which you're applying, but also look at the institution level, the university-wide. At UCLA, it's called this, the centralized office is called graduate division. Other um, institutions call it graduate study, graduate education, but you're looking also at the centralized office that has funding for prospective and current grad students. And then you're also looking, as I said earlier, uh, for the extramural funding. Uh, the federal uh, grants, I mean, federal funding is in, from 
uh, for example, the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, Department of Energy, Department of Defense. Then there are the private agencies, the Ford Foundation, Winogren, Paul and Daisy Soros, um, the American Association of University Women. So definitely you wanna look at all types of funding. And then of course, there's the statewide funding here in California, the Cal State system of California State Universities has some funding or are at least loans for uh, doctoral students who plan to go into college or university teaching and are thinking of teaching at the Cal State system. I'll go into that a little bit later. Also, there's funding at your national professional organization. So I'll go into that a little later, but if you haven't already joined a professional organization, I hope that by the end of this conference or by the end of the summer, you will have research and joined at least one. Uh, also funding that's available that is merit-based are teaching and research assistantships. These are departmentally based, but they're not just uh, in the department to which you apply. And again, I'll go into that a little later. I just wanna give you a little teaser to keep you alert. Um, then there's the need-based funding, which is financial aid. There is work study at the grad level, and there's also a program called the graduate work study. You should, not all universities have this, and it's a little, it's much more robust than what is the regular work study. And again, this is a tease for more information later. And then, of course, there are student loans. Um, these are a better way of funding your education, then putting your, your um, charges on a credit card. And of course, if you don't want any more loans or if you don't want a loan, if you never had one as an undergrad or a master's student, uh, that's fine. But again, my mantra earlier, apply for anything and everything for which you're eligible for as long as you're eligible. And that includes loans if you are a US citizen or permanent resident, plus, some grad funding is not only merit-based, but also need-based. So you might as well have that information available by the uh, application deadline so that you uh, are all set. Okay, so diving deeper into the merit-based support, I talked earlier about fellowships, scholarships, and grants. Um, they provide stipends and or fees and tuition, or they could also provide, a, they could in a, uh, alternately provide a salary. So let me back up and be a little more clear. You might get funded on these fellowships, scholarships or grants in one of two ways, either by a stipend or by a salary. So you definitely want to figure out what is um, the payment source because it is going to um, determine how you budget your money. So there are two major differences between getting a stipend and getting a salary. The first is that the stipend uh, is the timing of the payment. Stipends are usually paid at the beginning of the quarter, the semester, the term. Uh, if you're getting a stipend for your summer work, then you may have received half upon uh, the beginning of the uh, summer, and then you'll receive the other portion upon successful completion of your uh, project or the summer. Uh, during the academic year, again, it's going to be paid at the beginning of the month, the term, the quarter, the semester. Um, the salaries, on the other hand, are going to be paid after you've done the work, at the end of the week, end of the two weeks, end of the month, whatever the payroll system is. So, for example, at, UC, uh, at the UCLA, we have a fellowship for entering doctoral students called the Cota Robles, R-O-B-L-E-S, it's a four-year funding package, and it's a partnership between the grad division and the home department, wherein the grad division pays year one and four or later, and the department pays years two and three. The grad division's funding is in the form of a stipend, so you're going to be getting monthly um, payments at the beginning of each month. Uh, the department's funding usually is in the form of a TA ship or a research appointment. So that's going to be uh, paid a salary. So you're going to be get, getting paid uh, after the fact. So for example, in, in year one, your last payment will be made in May for June. And then if you your next year, uh, year two is in the form of a TA position, you're not going to be paid until November. So you have between May and November to figure out how you're going to get funding. So that's another reason to be aware of the type of funding, because it's going to be very important to how you budget. Some fellowship scholarships and grants will come with fees and or tuition. And fees and tuition, I mean, those, again, are just uh, 
terms, depending on the agency, on the university. Basically, it's the cost of education, including uh, mandatory fees, um, uh, um, what do you call it? Supplemental fees like health insurance. Um, uh, here at UCLA, we have the wooden size, our recreation center has a seismic fee. Um, maintenance. And so whatever is the cost of education, that's the type of thing you're looking for uh, to fund with your graduate um, fellowships, scholarships, or grants. Salaries may or may not pay um, fees and tuition. Um, and I'll tell you a little later how um, here and the University of California, certain salaries would pay your par partial fees and tuition. You're looking at, oh, I'm sorry, I'm Got. Another difference between stipends and salaries is the tax liability. Salaries are taxed automatically. Stipends are not. They are subject to taxation, and it is going to be your responsibility to keep track of what you've been paid, either by the contract you've been offered, the award letter, the offer letter that came with admissions. If you're looking to uh, come tax time for a 1099 or a W-2, that's not going to happen because in the paperwork that you've received and that you're going to forget because you're so excited about getting the award, it says we're not going to give you any uh, additional paperwork or any additional forms about your, your um, salary, your sorry, scholarship or fellowship. So it is your responsibility as a good grad student to keep track of whatever you've received. Now I say subject to taxation. If you use your if your fellowship scholarship grant comes with fees and tuition, the fees and tuition are not going to be taxed. The cost of education is not taxable here in the U.S. But if you um, also get a stipend on top of the fees and tuition, the stipend is subject to taxation, and it is going to be your responsibility to figure out what is due. So um, how do you do that? Well, if you don't have a financial person in your social or familial network, you can look IRS publication 970. I call it a good bedtime reading because it's government D's. It's a thick booklet in tiny type, and it's you know boring as all get out, but it has very much information, uh, very good information. There's also IRS publication 505 to determine if you need to pay quarterly estimated taxes. Sometimes if you wait until paying taxes uh, in April, uh, then the IRS determines that you should have been paying quarterly estimated taxes, then there's gonna be not only the tax liability, but the penalty. So you don't you need to figure that out. Now, there is, again, if you don't have a financial person in your uh, family or social network, then you could look at this group here, um, it's, uh, it's free, like H&R Block, Quicken, or whatever, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance. This is groups that are sanctioned by the IRS. They're located across the United States in various cities, and they also probably are at your institution come tax time. So look for them uh, beginning in January. They offer free advice and free filing in some cases, but it should you uh, decide to make an appointment with them and you're going to ask them about the tax liability of your fellowship or scholarship, make sure you request um, an appointment with someone who has that experience because these are volunteers, undergrads much like yourselves, and some of them may not have that experience. So they might send you back to an office like mine, whereas I would have to say, sorry, I'm not a tax person. I'm not authorized to give you tax information. You have to go back. So make sure you are you know, proactive as a good grad student and make sure you get set up with the right person. Uh, if you are an international student or know an international student, there's a whole different set of tax uh, laws and regulations, tax treaties with the home country and the U.S. So make sure they go to uh, place their campus's international um, student office. So you're looking for funding that is going to be uh, ideally multi-year because um, Grad school is not just one year, just like undergrad wasn't. If you're going for a master's program, most of them are two years, though some are one, some are four years. Um, but if you're looking at the doctoral level, the doctoral programs are anywhere from five to 10 years. The average is five to seven, but some of them can drag on a little longer. So you want to give yourself as much um, flexibility and financial support as possible. 
So you're looking for the multi-year. And don't worry if, like, say, the National Science Foundation says you can't have two federal grants or scholarships. That's okay. Apply, 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 and then worry about once you get all the money, how can I maximize the funding? Uh, you're not going to be able to get the funding on top of one another, but you are able possibly to stagger it. For example, the National Science Foundation, one of my favorites, is three years of funding usable over five. Um, they say no more, no federal, not another federal um, fellow funding, but you could get a private. So we have students at UCLA who have that Coda Robles that I talked about, that's four years. The NSF is three years, plus they have a private agency such as the Ford, which is also three years usable over five. So that's 10 years of funding um, that they're not even gonna be able to use, but it's still great because it gives you a lot of flexibility. And I'll go into a little bit more detail. And again, feel free to put questions into the chat and somebody's gonna help me um, identify what those questions are. So how do you keep the money? Well, you must maintain satisfactory academic progress, which at the minimum is a 3.0 or better. So this is something you need to do research on when you're looking at the grad programs is what is the minimum uh, GPA for the department? Now, if you're applying to like UCLA, there's a minimum GPA that grad division has, which is 3.0 or better, but departments could have a higher GPA. So that's what, something you need to look at. And usually at the grad level, the GPA is based on a 4.0. There's no extra credit for APs or college classes or whatever. So you're looking at a 3.0 over, uh, out of a four. Now, 3.0 is really kind of bare minimum. In grad school, if you get anything less than a B, you're, that's pretty much a fail because grad school, it's, you're supposed to be impassioned about it, uh, thoroughly uh, in, in love with whatever you plan to do because you're gonna need that, in, that, that interest and that enthusiasm to sustain you for the five to seven years and to get the, the uh, grades. But the satisfactory academic progress is not just grades. It's are you meeting the department's milestones of degree progress? For example, if there's a multi-unit course or a multi-term um, course, are you taking it in the proper order? Are you taking the exams, the qualifying exams or the uh, preliminary exams, whatever the department calls it, are you taking them on time? And are you passing them on time? Do you need to advance the candidacy? Not all departments have that process, um, but if they do, do they want you to advance the candidacy within four years? If you are advancing the candidacy in five years, that could put you out of satisfactory academic progress. So you may get a letter, uh, an offer of admission that includes funding, congratulations, we're proud to you know, recommend you for admission, uh, and we're offering you a fellowship in the first year and then funding for the next four years after that in the form of TA ship or a research assistant ship. But don't be surprised if come year five or year four, they say we're not giving you that funding, even though we promised it to you in your offer letter, because you haven't met the satisfactory academic progress. You took a time off. You didn't tell us you were having struggles. You didn't tell us. Again, be prepared. You must be registered and enrolled full time to have the funding. You're being funded to be a student, not to be, you know, taking a leave of absence or withdrawing. That being said, though, as I said earlier, you're going to be hit with a lot of academic and life situations um, that may slow you down and may make you say, I need to take time off. Maybe you're helping a family member. Maybe you're helping your parents support a family member and you need to take time off. Now, if you're getting funded and you need that money, there are possibly ways you can keep it, but you need to be in communication with your department as well as with the agency to see what is the possibility. But note that the if you don't say anything, you're going to lose that money and you might have to repay it depending on when you leave um, uh, at the beginning of the term, middle of the term. Uh, full time differs depending Sorry, on the. Um, mm -hmm. We have a question in the chat. Um, yeah. So from Natasha, uh, are external fellowships scholarships also taxable? 
Yeah, they're subject to taxation, as I said. So it is your responsibility to keep track of all the paperwork that you receive so that when it comes tax time, you'll have that information. If the fellowship or scholarship includes fees and tuition, that part is not taxable, but the stipends are subject to taxation. And you need to keep receipts for uh, what you might be using. Say, if you're using anything for education purposes, that expense could be deducted. If you buy a computer, if you use your stipend for uh, payment to research participants, if you need to travel to a conference, if you're registering for a conference, those are professional development expenses related to your education. So those could, not, could possibly be deducted from the stipend. Okay, any other questions, Sandra? Not at the moment. Thank okay. You. All right, so full-time, what is full-time? My undergrad institution, full-time was four units. Uh, each course was one unit. Full-time as an undergrad at UCLA is 12 units. Um, yeah, uh, full-time as a graduate student at UCLA is eight units. So don't assume that whatever your, is, your current institution um, defines as full-time or counts as a full-time enrollment in terms of how many units or credits a course offers. Always check the campus where you'll be attending to figure out what that enrollment is. Um, portable extramural, and then these are, if I were to see you in person, I would ask but what this meant, but since we are virtual and I can't see everybody's hands, I will ask my question, what does portable extramural mean? And I'll give you the answer. Basically, it's what it says, it's portable. It goes to you no matter where you go to school. So even if the, like the NSF is paid to the institution, but it's on your behalf, we cannot use it at UCLA for our NSF fellows for anyone else but that fellow. However, the, the, if the fellow decides to leave UCLA, they have the option or they have the possibility and they should take the money with them. And why would you leave? Okay, so I'm sure you've heard that um, part of the success of a grad program is a relationship between you and your faculty mentor, your faculty advisor. Um, so if that faculty advisor, again, I said you're applying to a particular department or a specific department to work with specific individuals. If that individual that you really want to work with is stolen by another institution, you've got two options. Uh, if you have outside money, extramural money, you could take that money and follow your faculty to wherever they go. If you only have campus money, then you've got to decide, do I follow my mentor with the possibility of having no money to support myself because there's no guarantee that the new institution will give you funding. Um, and there's no guarantee that the department uh, will give you money and that there's going to be another faculty member with whom you can work. In any case, it's probably going to be the case where you're going to lose at least a year trying to reestablish the rapport with that new faculty member. And the department doesn't want you to lose that time because they're under uh, a thing called time to degree constraints. And um, so are you in terms of what's expected as satisfactory academic progress. But if you have your own money from outside sources, you can take it and go to that other institution. A second benefit of having the portable money, I'm telling you to apply for funding at the same time as you're applying for admission. You're going to hear your admission decision anytime between January and April. You're not going to hear a decision on your funding, whether from the campus or from these extramural ages, until March at the earliest, Ford notifies in March, NSF notifies in April. So what happens if you are turned down or waitlisted from your uh, number one institution and then later you find out, oh, I've been given a Ford award. Um, again, I would wait for interactive in the audience, but I can't do that now. So what you do is you call the admissions committee back and say, you know, you declined or waitlisted my um, admissions application, but now I've just learned that I'm a Ford fellow for the coming year. Would that make a dis uh, difference in the decision? Eight or nine times out of 10, it will. Why? Many grad programs, particularly doctoral programs, have a policy of fully funding all entering students. And for whatever reason, your application, maybe your letters of rec were not as strong as the person who actually made the cut. 
But now you're bringing the prestige of this national international competition to the department and faculty are applying to these many of these same agencies that I will refer you to at the end, the four, the National Science Foundation, the NIH. So you are just giving the faculty more fodder for perhaps making their application to these same agencies successful. Look, we've got five you know, NSF fellows in the department. You know, it really looks good that and I'm mentoring three of the five, and therefore that seems to be a good reason to fund my research. Um, so that's the second benefit is that it could change your admission decision. Uh, third reason, some departments require entering students to TA or to work. And as I mentioned before, there's professional and um, uh, social cultural um, barriers that's going to hit you or shock you. And that's going to throw you for a loop in terms of making a successful first term grad student. So if you do have your own money and the department says, you know, all entering students must work, you can politely and respectfully say, you know what, I understand that I'm required to work, but I have, I would like to use my outside money until I get used to being a grad student and then I will TA, be a research assistant later on down the line or in another year. That's perfectly okay. Just be in communication with your department at all times about this. So again, those are the three benefits that I have identified for applying for the portable extramural fellowships. Um, okay. So here's a bit more about the National Professional Organization. And this obviously is only a tiny little sampling of all that are available because there are so many and multiple um, organizations even within one field. But for an example, if you're going into the languages, then Martin Language Association. If you're going into psychology, the American Psychological Association. If you're doing work on uh, African-American studies, the National Council for Black Studies. If you're doing work uh, linguistics, uh, linguistic society. So if you don't know what organizations are, are available to you, go back to campus, look at the postings on the bulletin board, what conferences are being advertised. Look at the CVs of your faculty member, of the uh, grad students, of the postdocs in your department. Where do they belong and where do are they making presentations? And again, I hope by the end of the summer, you will join at least one because there are many benefits to be had. One, uh, student membership, either as a current undergrad or a recently graduated undergrad is relatively inexpensive. It's kind of a sliding scale. So what you would pay as a current student or a recently graduated student is gonna be vastly cheaper than what I would pay as a full-time staff member. The benefits are, one, you're gonna receive premier publications in your field. For those of you who are pursuing doctorates in the uh, social sciences, arts and humanities, your dissertation is going to be, or your master's thesis is going to be uh, a, a relatively solo endeavor. So you're gonna need uh, an, you know, an interest to be able to write the thesis or the dissertation. What's at the end of every single publication, academic work, and that you're going to be providing, if you haven't already, is a section called Areas for Future Research. And those are uh, areas that the author or the researcher recognizes they didn't have the time to cover, but they understand that it would be contributory to the field. And that's what your dissertation or thesis is. As grad students, you are now producers of knowledge, not just um, consumers. So you need to produce some new knowledge that will be contributory to your field. Now, you may think, oh, I'm in sciences, I need to cure cancer, or I need to create peace in the Middle East. Those are huge endeavors. That's gonna take you too long if you were to try and do it as a grad student. But look at what the areas for future research say. So for example, uh, if you're in the social sciences and the research was on the uh, Asian American community, you might want to move to an African American community. Maybe the research was with adults, you wanna change it to uh, children, you were the the research was done with a quantitative analysis. Now you want to do a qualitative analysis. Uh, the research was um, a case study over uh, long term. 
I mean, over a one point in time, sorry, you want to do a longitudinal one over a long period of time. So these little tweaks can make a difference and can be the basis of the topic of your thesis or dissertation. Second benefit are the networking opportunities. Um, again, you're applying to a particular grad school um, or pro program or department, you're no longer applying to a university. So definitely when you go to these conferences, whether virtually or in person, great opportunity to interview faculty and current grad students. Faculty, yes, you interview them because they're not only looking for you know, to interview you or to query you, you wanna know of the faculty, how many committees have you chaired and successfully graduated students? Do you have any training grants, which are funds uh, the, the faculty apply for to use to hire research assistants to train them to be academic uh, researchers? Uh, do you have, are you gonna be on sabbatical, which is not a vacation, but it's time off uh, during the year that I'm planning to apply? Because if they are, your chances of being admitted to that program are gonna be very slim because the, the department is not going to want to admit you just to sit around twiddling your thumbs while waiting for that faculty member to return. So these are the types of things that you can um, um, ask. Uh, current grad students, and particularly if you do a campus visit, again, whether in person or virtually, you wanna talk to current grad students. Departments and universities have slick um, websites and you know, brochures and all this kind of stuff. But you want to talk to the people who are actually living what you're going through, because there may be like three Nobel laureates in the department, but none of them are around because they're on the road. So you don't necessarily, and then are, are there full-time faculty, tenured faculty, um, tenure track faculty, which means that they are permanent or hope to be permanent members. If they're all lecturers, which are part-time, you know, temporary faculty, they may not be available to mentor you. You should be looking for faculty to do one of all three things, support you academically, support you professionally, i.e. Uh, help you identify internships, um, help you co-author or single author articles or uh, editorials, something, whatever is the, the going, um, grail in that department, and they should support you financially. If they don't have their own research grants, they should at least be able to point you into the direction of uh, fellowships or scholarships that they can help you get, and that's, that, that's their um, support, financial support, if they don't have their own. So these are the three things you should be asking of faculty, and it's perfectly okay, and it, they're used to it. And then last but not least, some of these organizations have funding for their uh, members. Oh, let me go back to the conferences. Of course, you don't need to be a member to attend a conference or even to present at the conference unless the conference requires it. But um, the uh, registration is gonna be cheaper if you are a member. Okay, and so other funding, they may have flat out fellowships, scholarships, um, and they, but they also may have something smaller like a research grant or, um, research supplies, or they can help you travel, pay, you know, um, discounts at the hotel, discounted flights, et cetera. So all types of benefits um, that I really hope that you will take away from uh, joining an organization. So moving a little bit more deeply into uh, merit-based support, are teaching and research uh, assistantships. Again, not just at your department, but look at what might be available. Do you speak a language that is taught at the university? Do you, uh, was your undergrad major in uh, English and now you're moving over to comp lit as a grad student? Go back to the English, or go to the English department of your prospective grad school. Do you, are you looking for TAs? Those are the kinds of things. Um, uh, look at the research opportunities at UCLA. We have this website that talks about the various research centers and institutes many of which don't have any or don't have enough grad students. So you want to go there and again, be proactive about, produce, about presenting yourself as a viable um, uh, employee. Uh, here at UCLA, we have the Institute of American Cultures, which covers the four ethnic studies groups, which uh, centers rather, that um, have fellowships as well as research uh, positions for, the, um, for students in any uh, any part of the campus whose research meshes with theirs. These are at, at the University of California system. These are 
uh, academic apprentice positions, which if you're hired at 10 hours a week or more, then the bulk of your in-state fees are covered. So look for these types of opportunities uh, at whatever institutions you're applying to, particularly if it's a public institution and you're not a member, I mean, a resident of that state. Hi, Moving Sherry, quick. we have another uh, question in the chat. How much sure. of the membership do you pay yearly? Uh, you pay yearly and the membership depends on the organization. I think someone told me that for undergrads in the American Psychological Association, it was like 35 bucks. Um, so it differs. It's My answer to any question you ask me about admissions or funding is always going to be first, it depends. There is no one stop shop. Um, so it, it's always going to vary. Thank okay. you. That's the only question. Okay. So need-based support. So if you're a US citizen or permanent resident, make sure you fill out the FAFSA, um, even if you don't want a loan or don't want any more loans, because again, it's better to have and not need than to need and not have. And some fellowship scholarships are also need-based as well as merit-based. Um, and this is, again, plays into the work study. I talked about the grad work study. At UCLA, it offers you up to $10,000 during the academic year and up to $5,000 during the uh, summer if you're taking classes. This is much more robust than the regular work study. Also, you're going to be even more marketable to potential employers because the program will pay 70% of your salary, uh, not just 50 and your employer therefore only needs to pay 30%. So not all institutions have grad work study, but definitely check that out. Uh, for example, at University of California, Irvine, they have something like that. So um, definitely, and at UCLA, the grad program, um, uh, the grad work study is applicable to any job related to your degree, whether or not it's already posted on the work study site. And it's for any job related to your degree on or off campus. If it's off campus, it has to be for a nonprofit and it has to be a paid position. This work study doesn't provide the funding, it just helps finds a way to pay par partial. Other need-based support, if you are going for loans and your loans as an undergrad can be put on deferment as you are, uh, as long as you are at least 50% uh, enrolled grad student and the cap of what you can borrow as a grad student is gonna differ. Your, your cap changes, the clock restarts and it's a little higher um, cap if when you're in grad school. So hopefully you can remember that. Um, there are forgivable loans and loan repayment programs, and this slide just lists four of them. So definitely you want to look at loan repayment programs such as the NIH, which depending on your field that you are working in, these are basically after you finished your grad program, they have uh, programs that will repay your loan. Uh, uh, forgivable loans are loans that are erased if you do what you promise. So uh, if you plan to teach at the college or university level and want to teach at one of the 23 Cal State campuses, then you can apply for a forgivable loan. So every year you are lent up to $10,000 a year for up to three years. And then once you graduate, um, this is not a guarantee of a job. They just want to diversify the um, uh, faculty application pool. So every year you teach full time at the Cal State, they erase, they forgive 20% of the loan. Every year you teach part time, they forgive or erase 10%. And then I know I'm running short on time. I just want to briefly touch on how to apply. That's very important. So again, apply one year before funding is needed. Know what the agency is funding. The NSF Grad Research Fellowship is for the social sciences as well as life and physical sciences. It's also for MA and MS as well as the PhD. And they're funding, not only they're looking for the intellectual merit, what is the value to your field, but what is the value? What is the community good? So you need to talk about that in your application as well as your letters of rec should talk about that. Uh, four, they fund uh, potential college and university teachers, but if you, and who are going to bring diversity to higher ed or who already do, if you're planning to do it and haven't already been doing it, the four is not for you. Uh, but if you plan to teach at K-12, the Ford is not for you. Paul and Daisy Soros is for new Americans and it's all about civic and community leadership. 
Uh, and if you haven't done that, then the Soros is not for you. So be sure to know what the agency is looking to fund. And oftentimes the websites will give you uh, a sampling or a list of prior awardees so that you can see who's applying and who's, been, uh, who's, who's received the funding. Go by the agency's definition of the discipline. So don't, I mean, here at UCLA, psychology is a life science. Other places, it's a social science. And at the uh, NSF, it's a social science. Uh, UCLA linguistics are humanities, but it's a social science. So our linguistic students are eligible to apply. When you're writing your essay, you're writing it for what we call an intelligent ignoramus. That's what one of our professors call it because it's for faculty. The reviewers are not employees of the agency. They are faculty from around the world who have been um, asked to volunteer or get paid a very small stipend to sit in front of a computer to read the application. So you want to avoid jargon, you want to avoid acronyms. How do you apply paper? Yes, there's still paper in 2021. Do you apply online or do you uh, do both? Do you apply directly to the agency or do you need to go through another office? What type of transcripts and which transcripts? All of your education, including summer um, community college courses or just your last um, official transcript? What type of essays are required? What types of letters are required and when? Is it postmarked by or received by? Faculty letters sometimes can be um, received later than the deadline. So you need to definitely figure that out. Uh, volunteer experiences count. This because you didn't pay, uh, get paid doesn't mean you didn't learn anything. Uh, if standardized tests are required or even recommended, make sure you take them so that the results will um, reach the agency in time. So um, just the last couple of slides just go through some of the options. If you're looking at the University of California system, this document describes all 10 campuses. If you're a female going into any of these fields, and it, this is also for international students, uh, and this, the AAUW has some funding. Um, these are two examples of uh, professional organizations and their fellowship. If you're undocumented, be sure to check out what opportunities are available in the state where the campus is to which you're applying. Here in California, if you are eligible for the Assembly Bill 540, which includes documented and undocumented students, you know, you have that option. Uh, but if you're undocumented and you're going, uh, if you're a California AB 540, that will not help you if you're applying to institutions outside of California. So make sure you find out what um, uh, options are available. DACA, you can work anywhere uh, if you have DACA. Some of these private agencies also, like the Ford and the Soros, they're open to US citizens, permanent residents, and current and former DACA students. They're private agencies, so they can make that um, uh, eligibility requirement available. If you think you might want to do a master's at, the Cal, at a Cal State, look at this uh, program. It's a stipended research uh, experience during the academic year. And uh, the following summer, you get to go to any campus in the US where you think you might want to go to grad school and you get an eight to 10 week stipended research experience. Um, these are some of the fellowships for um, physical sciences, PhDs. Here's the Ford Foundation. They have diverse three year diversity fellowship for pre docs, they have a one year dissertation, and they have postdocs. Consider studying abroad or doing research abroad. You can get your master's or start your research or study abroad and apply at the same time as you're applying to grad school because should you get both, then you'll have a wonderful options. Um, you, you can ask the department, I've been given a Fulbright, I've also been given admission to your department, can I defer, can I postpone my admission while I do the Fulbright? Probably yes, because the Fulbright is one of our uh, most prestigious uh, fellowships. A uh, gem is for a master's and doctoral studies in the life and physical sciences for particular underrepresented groups. Hertz, physical sciences, uh, humanities, this is some uh, funding available for you. Leaveman is, uh, you cannot apply as an entering student, but once you are a grad student, find out if your institution is eligible to nominate. Not all institutions are. Uh, it's, uh, I like it because it's open to any degree objective, any field, um, but you must be a U.S. citizen and you must conduct your studies in the U.S. while you are funded. Um, here's the NIH training grant. This is where you can find out who 
which faculty at which campus has a training grant and that's why you can contact them and say, I see you have a training grant, are you planning to renew? Um, are you taking any new students? Here's the NSF, the GRFP that is one of my favorites is here. Oops, sorry. Um, they also have a training grant program. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community, this is an organization that gives you supplemental funding. Uh, and then here are some other funding. Paul and Daisy Soros for New Americans deadline, I think is October 28th. Um, what I like about this one, again, it's for any degree objective, any field, permanent resident, US citizen, DACA, current or former. And it's, um, you can apply in your first two years of a master's program, and then you can apply in your first two years of a doctoral program. Some agencies like the NSF, once you have your master's, you're no longer eligible unless you wait two years. So everything, it depends, but make yourself available. Uh, if you are a military veteran, spouse of a veteran, descendant of a veteran, child of a veteran, there's some funding out there for you. Uh, Yale University, you don't have to be a Yale student to use this, this website. It has some very good resources, not just funding info, but resources about how to write the good letter uh, and the good proposal, how to ask for letters of rec, uh, the timing of when you should be asking. All of you should apply for at least four or five of these databases, because if you were a Girl Scout, Boy Scout, you can hop on one foot and hula hoop, there may be funding out there for you, okay? So by filling out these databases, and all of these are okay, they, you should never be asked to pay for anything. Uh, the one that does have a membership is this one, SPIN, but it's more than likely that your home campus already has a subscription. So once you log on with your Yale.edu or your Stanford.edu email, they'll recognize you as a member of the uh, SPIN. So find, sign up for these, take the time to sign up, and therefore you're going to be getting information that of uh, funding that's going to be coming to you. And again, it could be a huge amount like the NSF 34,000. It could be something smaller. Lehman is 18. There may be 5,000 or 2,000. But the idea is to apply, 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 and then get the experience that you can use for your career. Because as I said earlier, um, the process for applying for funding is the same. It's just the objective that differs. And then last but not least, there are old fashioned books available in your local public library on your campus um, uh, uh, library. And you see there by ethnicity, by race, by uh, nationality, disability, veterans, and then in the fields. So that's a lot of work, a lot of information. Uh, in a very short period of time, I'd be glad to go or virtually go to your campus should you want to hear this again. But again, go to as many of these sessions as possible and uh, you'll be funded for sure. So questions, comments. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Diana Solis. Um, if you're interested in being a professor, is there a program similar to the CSU loan forgiveness, but in the UC system? No, flat out, there's no, no. Okay, and then um, what is, what, what was the name of the LGBTQ plus fellowship again? Point Foundation, and that's just one. Um, it's based here in LA. Uh, you must be out because they want you to advocate for the LGBTQ community. So, I mean, obviously, there are, I'm sure there are others um, across the nation. So these are the types of things you'd be looking for. And they don't have a, no, they, they offer supplemental funding. They don't offer a full package. Perfect. Natasha. Thank you. Um, yes, I see Natasha. Yeah. Um, this is the first time I've heard of the, the ASA Minority Fellowship. Um, and... I'm a, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm planning to apply for social psychology and I was wondering if they would, um, you know, like, would I, would I qualify if I wasn't doing sociology exactly, but I was doing something related to it? Probably. You should just look at the website and see what they, because they're very clear. All of you should be looking at the FAQs on the website um, and definitely contact the agency. Just don't contact them with um, and with questions that are obviously answered on their website and don't contact them around the deadline because they're going to be too uh, busy to um, 
respond. But Natasha, yeah, yeah I'm sure that they have, um, I'm sure it's all social psychology, I'm, I can't guarantee, but I'm sure it's a psychology. So they're not like super rigid with what, and you know what program you have to be in to be to you know to apply for the fellowship they'll list it on their eligibility criteria okay um that's another thing i like about the nsf they give you two opportunities to describe your research it's not just um sociology or psychology you can also say i'm doing the social work uh, social they don't fund social work but the social psychology because that will help them determine which faculty members they're going to send your application to so definitely look at um um the the projects that have been funded by the asa um but they're i'm they will also have the L the different disciplines eligibility and again go by the agency's um, description for example history at ucla is a social science some consider it like the Council of Graduate Schools. Um, they consider it a humanities. Psychology is a life science here, but other places consider it a social science. So you know, don't don't forget to expand your horizon if possible, and don't you know, don't be um, disappointed if your agency, if your discipline is not considered eligible for an agency. There's some others. There's so many. And social psych, yeah, that's very common. Okay, thank, right. you. thank you so much. Um, we have one last question in the chat. Um, I just do want to keep, I want to be mindful of time since some do have panels coming up, presentations coming up. And so we'll close up with this with this question here in the chat. Um, when you say to apply a year before, do you mean to have your funding accepted a year before or to start applying a year before? Well, okay, that's kind of rude interesting question. Okay, so you apply. So you're applying October, November, December. You're going to find out March, April, May, June, September, because, you know, people, if you were waitlisted and then the other primary people uh, decline, they're going to move down the, the pool. So you're going to hear information. Okay, so take an example. Fall 21, October, November, December 21, you're applying. You're going to get the information in winter and spring 22 for use in fall 22. So you're applying a year before, you'll find out maybe six months before, and then you use it in the fall. If you're not planning to go to school that fall, don't bother applying because the agency will not hold the money for you and they, they don't defer. You have to use it uh, uh, the immediately following fall. Okay, thank you. All right, everybody. Again, this recording will be available to you on our uh, McNair Conference website hopefully by the beginning of next week, since we do want to make sure that the, uh, in, the conference closes. But thank you so much to Dr. Sherry Francis. You honestly provided such a, a, a great information to our McNair scholars here today. Uh, my pleasure. And uh, oh, again, advertise that you're McNair scholars. Don't just leave it for your CV. Put it right under the, um, your degree. And there's a reason for it. Email me and I'll tell you there's a reason for it. But you want to make it known because 